Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Best Practices for Building LibGuides. Today's discussion is one in a series of webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A panel to submit your questions to Talia, our panelist. At the end of the presentation, we'll take a few minutes to answer those questions, um, so please submit them throughout. And you can use the chat panel, if you're seeing it, to alert the host, which is me, to any technical issues that you may be experiencing. And when I get that message, I will troubleshoot that issue with you privately. Please also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered for the program will receive a follow-up um, instructions on how to access the archived version. And now I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Talia Richards, our speaker today. Talia is the Marketing and Social Media Manager for Springshare, the maker of LibGuides. She's been with Springshare since September of 2010 and is responsible for all of the marketing and social media outreach. Talia lives in New York City. She has a master, um, master's in Library and Information Science from the University of Rhode Island and a Master's of Communication and Information Systems and Operations Management from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Talia spent 5.5 years at Johnson & Wales Library as a circulation manager, a reference librarian, a student coordinator, and finally, a digital services librarian. She's active on social media outlets, and you can find her on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And one of the things that she mentioned to me before we got started with the webinar is that she also um, is a juggler. So I will turn the floor over to Tally. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. And I'm just going to open up the Q&A panel on another screen so I have it. Um, there. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I am super excited to be here today. And I was just really excited when, when Mark um, asked me to, to do this presentation. And I'm not terrified at all that there are several hundred of you uh, in the room right now. I'll pretend that there's only one of you and I'm speaking to just one of you. My slides are available online with a complete bibliography um, and list of recommended sites, guides, etc. at the end. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and, and get this ball rolling. All right, so that's me on the left there, and I'm waving hi to my computer at all of you. Um, so I have a big caveat. Um, I am not an expert, although that's probably debatable with, with the experience that I have at this point. And, and when I say that I'm not an expert, I mean that I have not written articles or done any formal um, usability studies or, or anything of that nature. Um, all of my experience is, is much more of practical experience. So um, as Mark mentioned, I was five and a half years at Johnson & Wales University in a variety of roles, and um, I was the LibGuides and LibAnswers admin there, and I have been with the SpringShare for, for six years doing a variety of roles here too. Um, I've also, uh, you know, attended many presentations, read lots of articles and books. Um, Jason Puckett has an excellent workshop that I attended as well, and I wonder if he's in the room here with us right now. Um, and so I have a lot of um, practical experience with best practices for building LibGuides. Now, the biggest thing I want to kind of convey to you all is that these best practices are just suggestions. You know your users better than anyone, and certainly better than me. So please keep any of these tips that you think will work for your community and really discard the ones that, that don't. Um, and as always, your feedback and um, comments, thoughts, opinions, ideas are always welcome. So <clears throat> what are we going to chat about? And I figure I had to throw a picture of a kitten in here or a cat. And uh, if, you, if you were on the receiving end of our April Fool's joke, then you will know what I mean by libcat. 
But we're, we're going to chat, chat about kind of three major areas, big picture ideas, guide specific best practices, and some tips for writing for the web that kind of can encompass beyond libguides. Um, so really kind of all writing for the web ideas and strategies. Big thing, are you on LibGuides version 2? So with LibGuides version 2, it's free, and it's a free update. Um, most of my presentation is applicable to version 2, although there are sections that can be applied to both version 1 and version 2, or really kind of anything. Um, and if you look at my little rather rudimentary Venn diagram up in the top right corner, there's you, there's version two, and in the middle is happy, happy, uh, joy, joy. We do have um, uh, lots of help documentation on migrating to version two. In fact, we have an entire libguide on migrating to libguide version two. So please um, do check that out. And at the end of my presentation, there is a dedicated slide to recommended links for migrating to version two. So, so do check that out. That. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Big picture ideas. Number one, guides are web pages. I think people tend to forget that libguides are websites, they are web pages, because they are so easy to build. You can go in there, throw some links, throw some copy, add some images, and blammo, you're done. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be designed and approached um, as you would any other website in a thoughtful manner. I'm not suggesting that you, you know, bring in a committee. This isn't, this isn't your home page redesign where you need uh, lots of you to sit down and talk it out. But it does mean that when you think about them as you would think about an, any other web page, you do want to think about them in a thoughtful manner. Like, do I really need this here? Is this going to add anything? Is this make, does this make the guide more useful or usable? My second big picture idea has to do with the types of guides your users need. So there is a study done by Robertson Hunter in 2011 in the Journal of Library and Information Services uh, in distance learning titled New Library, New Librarian, New Student, Using LibGuides to Reach the Virtual Student. And a quote from this article um, says that researchers found students do not connect with general subject guides, but do find use for guides that are focused on specific courses. When we're thinking about um, un undergrads, they generally don't connect to the concept of disciplines which is how subject guides are traditionally structured. They think about their course. They think about a class. And to put this in context, when I was at Johnson & Wales and we were one of the first to get LibGuides, um, we created subject guides and course guides. And our course guides received just exponentially more hits than our subject guides ever did. And I'm talking in the many, many, many thousands of hits a month versus just a few couple hundred hits on the subject guides. And even more astonishing than that, and if you haven't checked out your Google Analytics, if you have enabled Google Analytics on your LibGuides, um, do check it out, was the bounce rate. So with course guides, the average um, amount of time that a student would spend on a course guide would was somewhere in the reign of, like, in the realm of seven to eight minutes. Whereas in a subject guide, they would only be on the subject guide for about a minute before they would leave and bounce out. So um, those were some really impactful stats that kind of dictated the types of guides that we um, created and investment of staff time and resources. If you are thinking, like, well, we still want to make subject guides, you obviously, you know, do so, but you can um, approach them as portals. Think of subject guides as portals that um, link to more targeted guides. And of course, what you create should be dictated by your user demographic. You know, broad subject guides for maybe um, masters or PhD, PhD students who think discipline, and course and class guides for maybe undergrads. 
My third um, big picture idea is a good LibGuides philosophy to have is to approach them as pedagogical tool um, that is constantly evolving and changing. They're in an almost permanent state of progress. Um, and when you think about it like that, when you think about that you are constantly working with something that is never quite done, um, it's always going to need tweaking, changing, updating, um, not static, your approach to them and to building them and creating them will be different. My fourth um, tip here from Big Picture Idea comes directly from um, uh, Jason Puckett's workshop um, where he introduced this idea of cognitive overload. It's absolutely fascinating and it makes total sense when I break it down to you. So basically there's a study by Little in 2010 titled Cognitive Load Theory and Library Research Guides in Internet Reference Services Quarterly that discusses this, this theory of cognitive load. And basically, cognitive load theory is the idea that cognitive capacity for learning is limited and that learners are often overwhelmed with information and interactions that need to be processed simultaneously before meaningful learning can occur. Now, an example of this is that if your users have to learn how to use your LibGuide system and figure out where the piece of it is that will accomplish their task before they can actually accomplish said task. Now, there are three types of cognitive load, and you'll hear me reference these throughout the rest of the presentation. So the first uh, cognitive load is called intrinsic cognitive load. It is the amount of cognitive processing required to learn the basics of the material. You want to manage intrinsic load, and that means breaking down topics into small subject areas or course guides, avoiding library jargon like stacks, database, OPAC, and uh, employing consistency of language and layout of how things look. Extraneous cognitive load occurs when cognitive processing is overtaxed or the information is disorganized or not relevant. You want to uh, reduce extraneous load by using clear pages and box titles to indicate how the information is organized. Eliminate redundant or wordy information that has to be parsed so the user understands what the purpose of the content is. Also, get rid of nice to knows, you know? We, uh, we're librarians, we like to give them every possible resource, you know, like these are the two you really have to know and these are the 82 nice to knows. Get rid of the nice to knows. Germane cognitive load occurs when guides promote meaningful learning, when verbal and nonverbal materials are used and learners are allowed to interact with them to create what is important here, personalized guidance. So promoting germane cognitive load involves using an informal conversational style in your writing, like I or you, rather than the library and the patron. And by the way, I was using quotes, like I was moving my hands around for that, if you can picture it. Um, creating course tailored materials, which meets their personalized research needs. And providing opportunities for reflection, discussion boards, comments, polls, surveys. We'll discuss more on that later um, when we talk about interactivity. So keep these three types of cognitive load in mind because they're going to come up again and again um, throughout, throughout the rest of our talk. And the last kind of big picture idea is um, specifically for those of you who are admin level users. Um, so. These are kind of key strategies, foundational elements. 5.1, think about consistency, setting up and using templates. A great way to reduce intrinsic um, cognitive load is to create customized templates by, for all of your LibGuides or maybe one template for course guides versus another template for subject guides. When you're creating templates, it creates a consistent look and feel. So when your users, when your students are navigating from English 101 to English 300, they look similar. So that it's not jarring um, and kind of dropping them out of the environment. 
You can also consider locking in design, so guide authors have to use it. Um, so you're like routing them through using the templates, um, and that can be accomplished by going to admin, look and feel. And um, for those of you who are a little um, keen on kind of altering the templates and really making them your own, you can add in elements to the template so that they are always, um, they're like locked in elements um, so that guides using those templates will have that content in the same place always everywhere. So if you've ever thought, you know, I really want to learn how to mess around and play with the guide templates a little bit, well, you're in luck because we have a recording available. Um, it's called Templates. It's one hour long. It really walks you through um, customizing the LibGuides templates, adding in your own elements, maybe a get help box so that it always appears on every guide that uses that template. Um, so really helpful information there. 5.2, create a style guide. So for those of you who haven't, um, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, strongly encourage you to consider creating a style libguide. Um, probably used definitely in-house, maybe you'll have it unpublished, maybe you won't. Um, and it basically contains instructions, um, like, a like, a, like a policy handbook for your guide authors. It can contain things like acceptable fonts, how to use images, proper use of colors, ways to consistently title your guides, acceptable ways to refer to the library services and resources to reduce jar jargon and therefore reduce that intrinsic cognitive load. There are tons of examples in my um, presentation at the end of lots of really great best practices. I really like this one by um, Indiana University, so if anybody is in the webinar today from Indiana University, you've got a great best practices guide. Um, and this is also in my presentation, but it just gives um, information on it using the appropriate box type, don't always use rich text, what to think about for mobile, um, and things like that. This can be a really great resource for your guide authors. 5.3, create a storage guide. A storage or reusable content guide is a place for you to put pages and boxes that people can reuse. Um, I have an example one. Here's one that we use. Um, a few suggestions of things that you can keep in your storage guide, pages on citation information, instructions on how to access databases off campus, boxes that you want to add to your home page, maybe a tabbed box that contains um, various search boxes, catalog search, database search, um, a box for your library hours, and maybe even a box for all of your get help, including chat, phone, texting, etc. What's great about um, having a repository of reusable content is that it ensures that your authors aren't reinventing the wheel over and over and over and over again. And it ensures that all of your updates are centrally managed. So let's say you suddenly decide to offer a new reference service, maybe Twitter, and you want to add it, uh, you don't want to have to add it everywhere, just add it to the, um, the original and it will cascade down to everywhere that it's been reused. And once again, it reduces that intrinsic cognitive load. If boxes and language are the same from guide to guide, students don't have to relearn the basics when navigating to different guides. For example, you don't want to have one EBSCO search box look completely different on one guide, and the same EBSCO search box look different on another. They're the same, but I, the student, have to relearn that they do the same thing. And lastly, for admins, um, 5.4, think about publishing workflows. This is a feature available um, in version two of LibGuide CMS. LibGuide CMS is the advanced version of LibGuides, or the platinum version, I like to call it. But it allows, um, it ensures that only authorized reviewers can publish the LibGuide. So it's great for enforcing your style guide, um, making sure that guide titles are structured as they should be, subjects have been assigned where needed, all images have alt tags for accessibility, um, the content from your reusable guide was reused properly, and it gives authors the freedom to do what they do best, which is create content, but it gives your reviewers control of how, you know, that everything is up to snuff and to standards. So publishing workflows is available for LibGuide CMS. 
You can enable it or disable it by going to Content, Publishing Workflows. You can add authorized reviewers here. And then once it's enabled, and let's say I'm here on my guide, um, my election 2016 guide, and let's pretend I want to publish it. I come here to uh, publish my guide. And when I select publication status, you'll notice that I don't have a publish button. I only have a submit for review. I can include an optional message that allows me to say, hey, can you look at this right away? I need it for tomorrow for a class that I'm doing. Um, and an email notification gets sent to all the designated reviewers so they know that there's a guide um, you know, waiting to be reviewed. Okay. All right, that's all for my big picture ideas. Let's mosey on over to guide specific best practices. These are applicable for any level of user, um, admins or regulars. Basically, if you're building a guide, this is applicable for you. Um, I have 13 tips listed here, but believe me, they are not the end all be all. Um, I had to really cut down, and if you guys had three hours, I, I don't even think we'd have time to get through them all even then. So um, do continue to um, do more research on this because um, there is lots of lots of good resources out there, and this is this is definitely not the, uh, the end all be all of all resources. So number one, best practices for tab boxes. With LibGuides version two, you can create what's called a tab box, which is really great, and they're a great way to save space on your page. Um, but it's important to be thoughtful in how you use them, particularly when um, with avoiding unnecessary clicks. So let's check it out. Here is a guide that I've built um, for today. It's our Lib 1000 guide, and we're going to spend a lot of time on here from here on out. Um, so my first page, my tab boxes, I've got a bad example and I've got a good example. And that's how the rest of these pages are pretty much structured. Bad example on the left, good example on the right. Um, and so when we're talking about stuff to throw into a tabbed box, things that should be in a tab bo tabbed box should be loosely connected with the same context. You know, um, you're not just going to throw random things in there. They should be loosely connected. Um, avoid unnecessary clicks. So don't put instructions on one tab, then the application on another, and then requirements on a third. You think that you're saving space, but actually tab boxes are great for putting the user in control. Um, this is a good UX principle, um, but you don't want to force the user to have to click through things. So a good example on the right is if I'm a student, I might want to find books and I might want to find databases, but I don't care about articles or e-reserves, so I'm going to avoid these tabs. I'm only going to click what I want to click. Whereas on the left, I am being forced to click through everything. Okay? So um, that's an example of, um, of avoiding unnecessary clicks. When creating a tab box, try and keep one row of tabs. Keep your tab names short and use consistent language. Um, that helps to reduce the intrinsic load, um, consistency of naming, and it manages extraneous load by keeping things organized. So you'll notice I have find, 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 rather than you know, search books, get articles, um, download e-reserves. Everything is just find. Best practices for gallery boxes, also in LibGuides version 2. And I hope some of you have checked out our brand new revamped gallery box options. If you haven't, you might, um, uh, you'll be really, really surprised. It's absolutely spectacular. So the new gallery box options, um, in addition to allowing you to add images, you can also pull books from the catalog assets, um, blog posts, recommended LibGuides, and even LibCal calendar events. Um, there's vertical and horizontal display, um, and you can create multiple rows. And for those of you who are really interested in accessibility, we've added alt tags. So you can make sure that you're, um, yep, and so I think Christine, Christina, you just answered my question. They are um, ADA compliant because we've got alt tags built in. Yay! So you can do that. Now my tips for gallery boxes. Let's mosey on over. Use them sparingly. There are still a few usability concerns surrounding this kind of content. 
So the first is, if you have a gallery box at the top of your guide, you're forcing your users to scroll down to get to the important content. We'll talk about that later when I talk about front-loading your content, but, you know, just keep that in mind. Try and keep all of your images the same size and width. If you look at this one on the left, um, some images are small, and then some images are really big, like this one. And so it's jarring to the user. Cynthia is asking a great question. All tags are a tag that you add to images for accessibility for screen readers. So if I'm a visually impaired person and I'm navigating your website with um, a screen reader and it comes across an image, it will read out loud the alt text that you have added in to describe that image because I can't see it, so I need to know what it is and the screen reader reads it out to me. Hopefully that um, explains what an alt tag is. So they're extremely important for accessibility purposes. Other things to consider with your gallery box is consider a slower speed. You can see the one on the left is moving pretty fast, okay? Um, remember, some users have motor skill issues. They can't click fast enough. Um, also, low literacy users need more time to read what's on the screen, and as well as non-native speakers. Limit the number of gallery boxes that you put on a libguide. Um, and here's why, for two reasons. One, gallery boxes increase the load time when loading your website, which is pr particularly important for your mobile users. Maybe somebody's not in a 4G spot. Maybe they're, they're in a, you know, a, low, a 3G or, um, gosh, what's the one below 3G? I'm blanking on that for a second. And so you've got to think about, do I want to have 10 gallery boxes on this guy that's really going to slow down the mobile loading? Also, if you have multiple gallery boxes on the same page, as you can see, I have two here, one on the left and one on the right. If they're running at the same transition speed, meaning the, speed, the same speed each slide is rotating, they're all going to transition at the same time. And then it just looks like those old school HTML marquees. It just looks a little bit... Um, dated, okay? Always, always add alt tags for accessibility. And if you're going to add descriptions, as you can see underneath the images, I have descriptions. Add them for every slide. Don't add them for some and then not for others. Um, and if you are going to add them for every slide, add the same amount of copy. So that way, this one, they're all one line. This one's a big paragraph. And then the next one's a short sentence. It's very jarring. So remember, it reduces that intrinsic load. Another thing is that you can make some images, you can make images be hyperlinks. My suggestion to you is if you're going to do that, make them all hyperlinks or none of them hyperlinks. Don't do some and then not others. Because I, the, the user, the student, I don't know if this is a hyperlink or this one, the next one's a hyperlink, and I, I, I'm just now clicking for the sake of clicking. So either make them all links or make none of them links. I have examples of some really awesome gallery boxes I want to show you. So here's an example featuring books from the books from the catalog. Um, so you can control that. That's really nice there. Here's an example where you can have multiple rows and you can have it fade rather than slide, which is nice. And down here is how you can add in other kinds of items rather than just images. You can have a book from the catalog. You can have um, a LibCal event. You can have a, another book. You can have, um, and then a LibGuide, all about the same kind of topic. And then lastly, you can even have image on the left and copy on the right. So there's lots of layout options for you and display options. Um, so the gallery box is a great tool, so have fun with it. All right, my third uh, tip, using the right asset type, okay? This is really important. What you want to add dictates what asset type you should use. So, I mean, you can't, you shouldn't hammer a nail, I should just say, shouldn't hammer a nail with a screwdriver. I mean, you could, it's not going to be pretty, and it probably won't, you know, come out the way you want it to. So when I say use the right asset type, I'm saying use the right tool for the job. Let's check that out. 
Now, as you know, with LibGuides, there are a variety of different asset types. There are rich text, database links, and so on and so forth. What you want to add should dictate the type of asset you use. If you want to add databases, use the database asset type. Don't use links or rich text. By using the database asset, you're using the same link that everyone else is using. It makes it easier for your admins to make changes, and it also makes it easier to get aggregated stats. Not how many times the database was clicked in your guide, but how many times the database was clicked across all guides. When adding links to your guides, use the link asset. Don't use the rich text. And, you know, there's an argument, what's the difference between a database and a link? Database, I would qualify as any paid for resource in the library. Link might be, you know, Wikipedia, whatever uh, kind of free resource that you have out there. Occupational Outlook Handbook, you get the idea. When using a link asset, you're able to reuse it, you get stats, and the link checker checks it. When using books, um, when you want to add books to your guide, use the book asset. Don't build a table in the rich text. Book assets are reusable, and they're also checked wink, uh, weekly by our link checker. And um, as you saw earlier, you can use our new gallery box for displaying books. And so this kind of segues me into my next tip, which is, Tables are for tabular content, not for layout and design. So let's see what I mean by that. Back in the old days of the internet, way long ago, you would construct a website by using tables and rows and columns and even nested tables. Now things are, you know, with anything, times are changing, times have progressed, you don't need to use tables um, for your uh, layout or display. So on the left side of the screen, you can see that I have a book image on the left, and then I've got some copy on the right, and this is in a table. It's a two-column table with two rows. Remember, tables are for tabular content, not for design. If you, um, if you want to really uh, control the layout, Think about bootstrap rows, and I'll show you something about that in a second. But what you should really use is aligning left or aligning right. When you go to add an image to your guide, there's an option to choose how you want to align it. So if you want to align the image to the left and have copy on the right, or you want to align the image to the right and have copy on the left, that's the function you'll use. Don't use tables. On the right side of the screen, I have some good examples of tables. Um, this is exactly how, what you want to use to display um, tabular content. So um, Egon Spengler, um, what time his office hours are, there's um, Euphigenia Doubtfire, and of course Phoebe, Phoebe Buffet. I see some folks have questions about the gallery box type. It's just in the new box, it's just in the new gallery box type in version two of LibGuides. Um, and Dolores is asking a great question. Is there any way to center the image except in HTML? Um, that's correct. The only way to do that is in HTML. Um, so left or right? Good question. All right, let's go back to our, our um, slides here. Um, <clears throat> one of the great things to do with your LibGuides is to build in interactivity. And I say, welcome to the wonderful world of widgets. Um, we're going to talk more than just about widgets here, but um, why build in interactivity? Um, because it addresses the learning styles of digital natives. You know, they're growing up in a world of Snapchat and Instagram, and so they're used to lots of different media options at their fingertips. It addresses the multiple intelligences of the user. It helps users with various learning styles, read, write, visual, auditory. It promotes anytime learning, and basically it's just a fun and interesting and multimedia rich way to create um, some guides. So let's check out some examples. 
So here on the left, I have just a widget that I found by Googling electoral college widgets, and I found one from 270 to win, which is an interactive electoral college widget map, and it's pretty cool. Here's a widget for Wolfram Alpha, and if you haven't, definitely check out Wolfram Alpha widgets. They're pretty awesome, and there are like a ton of them. And it's really easy to do. You just copy the widget. If you can copy and paste, you can add widgets to your guides. Um, so just copy and paste the code, and paste it in right here with the embed code. Naming is really important um, for your widgets um, because it just helps you find them later on in the future. So I strongly encourage you guys to come up with a naming convention. Great for a style guide for those of you who are admins. So for example, if this is a widget, I might preface it with widget, colon, what it does, and where it's from. If it was a search box, I might change this to be search. If this was a video, I might change this to be video. So that way, when I look back on this in six months from now, I'll remember what this is for. So it's really easy to add. Um, all of Springshare tools have widgets. So here's a widget that I have from LibCal to book a study room. And voila, it, it shows up right on the guide and allows me to interact with it right on the guide. So that's fun. Um, <clears throat> here's a, um, and here's the eBooks tutorial from LibWizard basically loads a tutorial so that I can go through. Um, oh, and that's a great question. Linda's asking, what asset am I in? So all I did was I added a media and widget asset. That's it. Okay. Now, when we're talking about widgets, they should be relevant. Don't throw a widget in for the sake of throwing a widget in. It comes back to the limiting the amount of need-to-know resources, or the, I'm sorry, the nice-to-know resources. Um, and very sad, for those of you who uh, were active users on Widgetbox, which was a great website that had thousands of different widgets, apparently they, went, they were decommissioned in 2016. Um, but check with your vendors, Mango Languages, Credo Reference, et cetera. They have lots of stuff. There are other ways to build in interactivity, though, beyond widgets. There are polls. Here's the poll asset type. And all I did was create it using the poll asset type. And um, with LibGuide CMS, those of you who are on the CMS version, there are discussion boards. Um, so you can create discussion boards and create, um, you know, interactive discussions to have with your users, with your students. Um, they do need to have what's called a patron level account to be able to comment. Um, but what's great is that you can mass email them right from within the system to invite them to create a patron account, which is super great for class assignments. Like if you can get all of the students' email addresses in a class that you're teaching, you can email them all to invite them to work on this discussion board. And it could be for extra credit, it could be for anything. And so here's, you know, here's a discussion I started on how do you feel about the current election results, and here's a student's response. Um, so this is great for class assignments because it promotes germane cognitive load. It's personalized to their class. It's for them. Okay. Bottom line, building in interactivity is great so that way your students aren't just reading copy and links and copy and links. Okay. Number six, building in a positive um, user experience. Um, interactions with LibGuides are interactions with the library. I think people tend to forget that. And so it's important, as important as it, is, as it is for you to have a good experience when they physically walk into the library, they should also have a good experience when they're accessing your virtual content. Um, if they click a link and it's broken or it takes them to a database website with an empty search box in it, Students can be left feeling confused and abandoned, and that's not a positive experience at all. So what you want to do is create an environment for success, and I have two suggestions for that. The first is um, from a, 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 an article by Sweller in 2006 called The Worked Example Effect in Human Cognition, and it's called The Worked Example Theory. Basically, rather than linking people, linking students to a database and having them go off and use that database, instead you link them to actual search results within the database. So on the left here, I've got some copy with, hey, you know, try these search terms, and then here's the link to the database and good luck. On the right, 
I have links here to persistent search results. So when the student clicks renewable, renewable energy sources, it will actually take them to a list of articles in EBSCO that are about renewable energy sources. Now, this can be controversial, and people think, you know, are we doing the research for them? And I completely understand about that. But it does help to reduce the intrinsic cognitive load because they don't have to remember how to search. The link constructs and executes the search for them. So maybe it's good for freshmen or um, English as a second language classes, maybe not for advanced upperclassmen. Um, and remember, you can use the gallery box and create annotated screenshots. So here I have a link to Renewable Energy Sources, which is a persistent link to EBSCO, and right above it is an annotated screenshot explaining what I limited it to, what phrases, and, and so on and so forth. And if we kind of scroll ahead, you can see how um, I was able to uh, teach as well as provide a successful experience for them. My second tip for providing a, you know, a positive library experience is to add your contact information to every LibGuide. Um, how you want to do that is really up to you, whether you put it on every home page, whether you create a dedicated help page, that's your call. Um, and this is from a 2015 study by Duncan titled Implementing LibGuides 2. And they found that having contact information on every guide encourages students to ask for help. So where you put it is up to you, but just be consistent with the placement. If you all decide to have it on the home page, then everybody has it on the home page. Once again, reducing that intrinsic cognitive load. Seven. What to do with your guide homepage? I feel like a, I get this question a lot. Um, and, and the answer to that is it depends. So it really depends on you. Um, when you're deciding what to do with your homepage, I have three suggestions. The first, make it an overview of what the rest of your guide is. Maybe, you know, this guide covers X, Y, Z, ways to get help, related guides, you know, MLA connected to your English composition. FAQs about this LibGuide, like top 10 FAQs about MLA, your librarian profile box, top 10 things to know about the library. I have a couple examples to show you about this. So here's um, a really incredible guide on Beyonce's Lemonade by, um, by Jenny Ferretti. And so her homepage has just this, about this LibGuide, and it gives you some information on it. And then here's another example um, from Scotch College in Australia. And yes, this is a LibGuide, Ideas That Shaped the Cold War in Europe. And they have an introduction page. And they have a brief introduction about the topic. Another way to approach the home page of your LibGuide is to just use it to add best bets. Assume that they don't look at any other page in your LibGuide but the home page. And if they only looked at the home page, what are the three to five resources that they have to know about that topic? You could also add the syllabus and your Get Help Library info. Here is an example from Mount Holyoke. Um, this is Chris's um, uh, dance guide. And on her home page, she has what she calls core resources. So assuming they don't go anywhere else, if they just came to this page, they would at least get the basics information. And then my last suggestion for what to do with your home page is I think what Jason Puckett would really recommend is ditch the home page, just get right into it, don't have a home whatsoever. And here's an example from my old workplace, Johnson & Wales University, their climate change LibGuide. It goes right to green business, green travel. There is no home page. It just gets right down to brass tacks. OK. My eighth tip is reduce the number of resources. Um, they're not going to click everything. Of course, this depends on your demographic. What is too many resources depends on whether they're a freshman or whether they're a PhD candidate. Remember, who is this guide for? As I mentioned earlier, I would, say, you know, it might be controversial, and I see I saw a comment earlier, eliminating the nice to know resources. And this is based on actual research that people have a finite amount of working memory or what they can be actively thinking about while performing tasks such as reading and learning. So with that in mind, that they have a finite amount of memory, um, I recommend three to five resources tops. That's my recommendation. Um, but once again, 
you know, dictated on your demographic. And so here's an example. Here's a lot of links on the left side. And here's recommended resources with just three. Okay. Next up, number nine, use only one row of tabs. If you're building a libguide, um, and you've noticed you've got a lot of rows, that's a cue to you to break it out into other libguides of smaller topics or nest them using subpages, okay? Short tab names rule, okay? Don't use long titles for your tabs. Um, don't fit the function. Um, it doesn't fit the function of the tabs, which are meant to be short and concise. And once again, be consistent. So if on some guides your books tab is called find books and on other guides your books tab is called recommended books, once again, that is increasing the intrinsic cognitive load and we want to reduce that as much as possible. Okay. Oh, and it was a great question. How do you make subpages? Great question, Deb. So when you go ahead and add a page, it will choose to, it'll ask you where to position it, and then you can nest it as a subpage of anything else. That easy. Okay? Let's talk about um, number 11, which is box borders for emphasis. Restaurants do this, and they've been tricking you for years. They take their most expensive venue items, they put them kind of in the center of the venue, and they outline it with a box border. Um, if you've ever seen Secrets of a Restaurateur, that's kind of the number one tip. And it kind of draws your eye to it so you go, oh, I do want to get the $28 salmon rather than the $14 burger on um, page three. So when you think about it like that, you can use your own box borders for emphasis by creating floating boxes and hiding everything else. So let's check that out. I've got three boxes on this page. I've hid the box borders for two of them. Everything looks fine to you, except when I preview it, you'll notice that only the center box has a border. All of the other boxes are hidden, no borders. And so my eye is automatically drawn to the stuff in the box border. This is a great way to visually draw people into what you think is the most important content on the page. Um, a great way to do it is you can hide borders um, system-wide, um, and then when you're uh, uh, wanting to hide box borders, you just come here and you create what's called a floating box. You just click it, and voila, I've created a floating box. Yeah, I'm getting some questions from people that are like, I just want to change one box. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests for that, and it's definitely on our um, to consider list for LibGuides version two. All right, number 12. This is, I fully anticipate several of you to disagree with me, but I've got some backup uh, evidence to back myself up. Avoid opening links in a new window. This is very controversial. So here I have um, from the W3C standards page, it is guideline 3.2.5. Opening links in a new window makes web pages not operate in predictable ways. So the user knows that when they click a link, it opens. If they right click on a link, it opens in a new window. But if you force links to open in a new window, that is called a change of context that is not user requested. So I would strongly encourage you not to open links in a new window. And my last um, general guide best practices has to do with giving guides and pages friendly URLs always. And what do I mean by that? So we know that we can give a guide a friendly URL, but a lot of people forget about pages. Pages can have friendly URLs too. And that helps to imply proper deprecation. I know that the borders page is nested in the libguide called lib1000 in the domain of springylib.libguides.com. If I go to a page that doesn't have a page level friendly URL, it doesn't imply proper deprecation. Plus, when I share the link, I don't know what this link is. So there's no description, and therefore, if I tweet this, people might not click on it because they're like, what is CPHP? I don't know what that is. 
So always give your pages a friendly URL in addition to your guides. And you can do that by coming over here to page and going page properties. Oops, nope, wrong. I was totally wrong on that. Click the pen icon. And it's that easy to give your page a friendly URL. All right, let's jump ahead because I've got to get through the next little bit rather quickly. We're running out of time. Writing for the web. Um, these are tips that can be accessible to, uh, applicable to anyone, but you need to ask yourself, what do you want to say? What do your users need? And who are your users? So number one, people do not read on the web. They skim. This has been proven time and time and time again. It's very important to create attractive copy that holds the reader's attention. You can have great resources, but if they're not communicated in an easy to read way, you're going to lose the user. Web readable copy is concise. Cut all the words that you have in half and then cut it in half again. Remember, less is not more, less is less, and we want less is less. Web readable copy is scannable. You're going to use things like bulleted lists, HR lines, headers. Web readable copy is objective. You're going to use neutral language. Avoid exaggerated or subjective language like amazing, awesome, incredible, spectacular, that, you know, the best. Um, and uh, Jacob Nielsen has a great uh, page on how users read on the web. And everything that I just said to you about concise, scannable, and objective is all here right on this page. And by the way, all of these resources are in my guide. Other things to do um, is to make use of chunking. Copy chunking is when you break things out so the eye can scan through easier. So use headers um, to imply deprecation. It's also incredibly important for screen readers, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Use bulleted lists. Use parallel parallelisms, it's a hard word to say, um, and I'll show you an example of that. People see patterns and anticipate what's happening next. Use tables for tabular content. Use line breaks. Line breaks actually stop the eye. Use special containers. And I'm going to show all of this to you when we get to the end. Be strategic about your copy. Okay. Remember, front load your important content and reduce the amount of copy. Less isn't more, less is less. There's a uh, very famous F-shaped map on the Jacob Nielsen site that shows you how people read a web page. And when you think about the F map, um, you, you're thinking top center, top middle are the important areas to front load your content. Start your sentences with action carrying verbs. You know, see what I did there? A little bit of a library pun. Um, so avoid writing in the passive voice. If you would like to renew your books, just say renew books. And um, things like get a library card, check out books, read these articles, access resources. Start your sentences with action carrying verbs. Try to avoid jargon as much as humanly possible. I saw a question earlier where someone was like, well, how do I not use the word database? I understand sometimes it's unavoidable. It's just part of the language. But where you can, try to avoid it, you know. And you can see here in my sample sentence, there were many places to avoid it. Um, there's an entire website called Center for Plain Language that has a checklist on writing uh, in plain words. And it has nothing to do with dumbing down your copy. Even very highly educated people read simple words faster. So instead of using obtain, use the word get. Instead of using the word purchase, use the word buy. So you can see how using a simpler version of the word just can be communicated easier. Use natural language, be informal. Use you or I rather than third person terms like the library and the patron. And use contractions. You don't have to say you are, just say your. Um, it also allows the person, the user, to connect with your writing, which promotes your main cognitive load. And consider creating headers that are questions, which also connects to the user. When you're thinking about writing, think about writing in a helpful tone rather than a legal or bureaucratic tone. Don't use click here. 
people know a link when they see it. To that end, avoid using underlining when you're writing web copy because people will think it's a link. Serif fonts are difficult to read. So uh, use serif fonts, although they're very pretty, use them for just headers or box titles and use sans serif fonts for your body copy. So here is um, the difference between sans serif and serif and serif just has the little hats. And this is a great site called CSS Font Stack, which has a list of tons of web safe fonts. Um, use color with purpose. Like your box borders, colors are intended to attract the reader's eye. So use them to show importance. Um, and when you're thinking about using colors, think about accessibility and appropriate color contrast. So um, there's a tool called Web Aim Contrast Checker. And if you put in your colors, it tells you if it passes the test. For example, if you try to use white text on a gold background, there's not enough contrast for someone who might be colorblind to be able to see and read those words. So you can use your color checker to make sure that you have appropriate color contrast. Avoid caps. Why so angry? Comes across as yelling. On that same token, use bolding and italics sparingly. Where possible, use images. Images are more than a thousand words. There are many, many thousands of words. And annotated screenshots are even better. There are lots of tools that you can use to create annotated screenshots, and I list a few at the end of my presentation. And last but not least, centered copy is hard to read. The irony, of course, being that everything in my presentation is centered. Um, always go left aligned. All right, so let's see all of these tips in action. I have a, ta ta a tab here, so I'm going to say table, with my bad example and my good example. So on the bad side, we have a lot of copy here. Who's going to read all of these sentences? It's very passive language. If you are a freshman, you may check out 10 books, 3 DVDs, and 2 CDs at a time. It's lack of natural language. It's very formal. No contractions, if you are. You'll notice it's all in serif font. It's harder to read. There's a click here, right here. There's a lot of jargon. There's no plain language, no simple words, periodicals, OPAC, procedures. There's not a lot of chunking and excessive use of colors. And look at this centered copy down here at the bottom. Even as a menu, it's harder to read, and it takes longer to read as well. Now let's check out what's going on on the good side, on the right side. First side is I'm promoting natural language by using headers that ask a question. It helps the user to identify with the copy because they go, oh, that's me. How do I borrow things from the library? So it helps them to identify um, with the copy. It promotes that germane cognitive load. You'll notice I'm using a variety of chunking techniques. I've got headers. I've got bulleted lists. I've got line breaks. These are those line breaks right there. I have tables. I've got lots of chunking, which makes it so that if I don't care about these top two things, I can just jump to the thing that I am most interested in. You'll notice I'm speaking in the active voice. Click here, enter here, select. Um, you'll notice the parallelisms. So parallelisms are when you have two items that um, uh, correlate to each other and people can see the pattern and know which one they're supposed to be so that they don't read the whole thing. So how do I borrow things from the other library? I know I'm not a member, so I'm only going to read this. I don't have to read the top one because I I'm, know I'm, I'm not a member. You'll notice I make use of bulleting, annotated screenshots. Everything is left aligned, and there's a lot of natural and plain language being used. Uh, really quickly, I'm going to show you some of the tools that I utilize to create this, um, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions. I know we're getting right to about that time. So I created all the stuff you see here in rich text. Um, so when you go ahead and add the rich text, you'll notice this is where you can create headers. Purposefully, we start with a heading three, and that's because heading one is reserved for the title of your guide and the pages. 
Heading 2 is reserved for the box title. So everything inside of your guide has to be a Heading 3 or less. And that's because screen readers who are reading to visually impaired students allow um, students to jump from header to header. So having um, your box content contain Heading 3 and below is appropriate deprecation of the content. Um, a great way to visually draw the eye to some important content is using containers. So right over here under Styles, I chose Container, and I can just put Alert, Library Closing Tomorrow, and it creates this nice little box. Um, line breaks are a great way, oops, undo, 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 um, to add uh, line breaks. And so right there is a line break. You can add line breaks, voila. Um, and of course, if you're adding a table, there are great bootstrap row options here for creating really, really beautiful bootstrap rows. So definitely play around with them because there's even some on hover customizations that are at your fingertips. Um, yes, cancel. Let's go back to our slides. Okay. I feel like there were tons of questions coming in. So, um, Mark, how do you want to handle all these questions? Well, um, I think we've, you're, you're right. We have a bunch of questions. Um, I've got a bunch in the hopper here. Um, I think let's just take a few minutes and, and go through a few of them. Um, and if folks have others, they can uh, drop them in the Q&A box. Um, I'll try to sort through them and get to the most relevant ones. We'll give it just a couple of minutes. Um, so in order not to spend any more time, let's uh, jump into a few of the questions we've got here. Um, one that I think a lot of folks have been asking and are interested in is this one from Kelly that we just recently got. Um, she says, this is a lot of new and important evidence-based info. Where can I go to stay updated on this as it, as it changes over time? Do you have any resources that you would share with folks or, or other things, places that you would suggest? Great, great, great question. So um, being, being the librarian, I would strongly encourage you to set up some RSS feeds, pulling from your databases um, and using, you know, libguides, best practices, usability, user experience keywords. And so that way you can get alerts about any new articles that are being published. Um, you can also set up Google alerts to do that as well. Um, I also have, as I mentioned, a bibliography at the end talking about all the resources that I mentioned. Um, and you can check the bibliographies of these resources and get even more readings um, if you'd like. Um, there are a lot, quite a lot here. Great, thank you. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, and I would, mentioned to folks that we will be sending out a link to the um, to the presentation so you can see these things all um, on your own on your own time and at your convenience um, let's see we've, we've got a question here from uh, Maureen sort of more specifically where she asks if, if uh, you you're embedded in a class via the CMS as opposed to through LibGuide. Would there be any reason to use a LibGuide discussion board over the CMS discussion board? Do you have any perspective on that, Talia? Oh, that is a great question. So one of the things to remember with um, courseware discussion boards is that they are probably connected to actual grading outcomes inside of the actual courseware tool like Blackboard. So in those instances, you would probably be better off using the discussion forum inside of the, the courseware tool. If, however, you're working with a class that isn't really using the online course or, or the course discussion, um, or you have a library 101 class, that would be a great example of using discussion boards inside of, um, inside of LibGuides. Um, also, just Having some, not everything has to be kind of connected to um, uh, learning outcomes, so to speak. I mean, the example that I had here was just about getting our um, uh, community discussing kind of a uh, controversial and 
tumultuous election season. You know, this is not necessarily connected to a course outcome, but kind of getting the pulse of our community and how they feel about the election. So you can use discussion boards in that regard too. Um, you know, just outreach, community outreach. Great, thank you. Um, we've got another question here. Oh, Mark, I'm just going to interject really quickly. I'm seeing a lot of folks, a lot of folks want the link to my uh, my Lib 1000, and yep. I will. I didn't add it um, to my list of resources, but I will. So right after right. the webinar today, I will add it to the list um, of resources. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that is definitely something we've seen a lot of folks asking about. Um, so we've just had a sort of a, a question come through here from Lauren. And uh, Lauren asks, regarding serifs, what you just said is the opposite of, of what um, this person has heard, that the serif fonts are easier to read, and they've seen statements in books on that uh, and other places. Could you talk a little bit about that? Is there a difference between reading on a screen and reading in a book? Or, um, and, and what is the evidence around that? Oh, um, well, that's really interesting because because I'm I'm hearing the exact opposite. Everything that I've read about writing for the web is always um, try to avoid. Oh, you know, yeah, always avoid serif fonts um, because serif fonts have a what they call a hat and a foot. Um, it's like the little you know thing that sticks out um, at the bottom and the top, and it's just it's not as easy to read. If you were to compare, for example. Um, uh, Times New Roman with Helvetica, it's, uh, Helvetica is cleaner. There's lots, less flourishes. So um, it is easier on the eye, particularly on a web, on a computer to read. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it's not a, a direct correlation, but think about like wedding invitations that you get that have like all of those fancy language. And you're like, does this say July or June? I don't know. The language is so cursive and Poorly, I can hardly make it out. It's kind of similar um, is, is this concept of serif and sans serif. So people do use serif fonts for, because they're pretty, so you can use them for like headers, short, short bits of copy, um, but for body copy, like paragraphs of text, everything I've read is, is sans serif all the way. Oh, maybe it has to do with print. Oh, Loring, thank you for that. It's it's print versus computer. So serif is easier in print, and sans serif is easier on the computer screen. Thank you for um, clarifying that, Loring. Yes, thank you. Um, we have so many questions here. <laughs> it's hard to, to call them for, for um, the most interesting. Let me look here. Um, we had a question earlier about uh, from Judy that I think came up and perhaps came through the chat. So I don't know that it was captured in the Q&A box. Um, but Judy asked, for publishing the guide, if a creator submits a guide for review and enters a message, is that message emailed out to all of the, the folks who are supposed to be reviewing the guide? Um, and I'm not sure exactly where that fell in the presentation, but it was pretty early on. Um, do, you, do you have an answer for that, or is that, is that enough information for you to, to work off of, Talia? <laughs> yes, and the answer to that is yes. So if I submit a guide for review and I added a message, it gets sent to everybody who is the authorized reviewer can see it. Great, that's very straightforward. <laughs> um, so Angelica asked when, uh, regarding the, the galleries, uh, um, the carousels rather, um, how do you, she asked, how do you have multiple rows of books like that, like those shown in the gallery boxes? Oh, let ever, me show you. Like, yeah. <laughs> let, let me see how, how you set it up. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, when you're altering a gallery box, you just click on the little cog icon, and you'll notice over here there's an option for um, rows. So that's where you'll create multiple rows. Um, and then um, 
there you go. That's it. So over here in the option is where you can have multiple rows stand out. Great. That's that's really that's very useful. Thank you. Um, of course. We have another question here, and maybe I'll do one or two more after this. Um, from Debbie that asks, what is the best way to take a screenshot so that it appears clear in a LibGuide? Ooh, good question. So um, if, you're, if you're talking specifically about um, tools, um, I strongly encourage you to uh, have a small investment and I'm jumping ahead because I actually have so much helpful resources on here <laughs> um, to creating annotated screenshots. There are two that I recommend. There are probably more. I personally use Snagit. Single user license is about $50. Um, you could probably get a multi-site license from less. And then there's Fastone that's only about 20 bucks. So it's pretty affordable. Um, and what I normally do is I try and take the largest, um, I try to make it so that it's readable. So for example, if we come back to my, uh, my annotated screenshots um, example that I had, which I'm trying to remember where I put that. Um, was it over under asset types? Um, Anywho, if I can remember where I put it. Oh, I think it was under interactivity. Oh, positive UX. See, even I can't remember where I put my stuff. So try and get as much of the screenshot as you can that is relevant. If you notice that it's so small, the copy is so small that it's impossible to read, um, just zoom in on the area that is most important, but leave enough of the screen that it provides context. So in this particular example, I'm going to um, just open the image in a new tab. In this particular example, it's a rather large screenshot. If I wanted to highlight just the stuff that's going over here on the left side, I might crop it right about here on the right side of the screen um, and not include this stuff over on the right side, just so they get some context. Does that, does that help answer that question? And I see lots of people are writing in with tons of um, awesome screenshots examples. Um, there's, yeah, obviously, there's Jing. I use Jing for videos, but yeah, oh yeah, duh, Jing. Um, um, apparently, there's one called Screen Grabber. Is that what I'm seeing? Um, that looks pretty cool. But these are all, the, I'm sure you guys can find tons and tons of tools to do it. Definitely. And we have, yeah, tons of examples coming in. So, so thank you for, for all of those. Um, sort of a question of clarification that perhaps some other folks had. Um, Susan, a little earlier, asked, do you really mean deprecation? What does that mean? And, and she apologizes if she missed your earlier um, definition of that. Okay. Okay. When I, when I use the word um, deprecation, I mean to show proper nest, nesting of a concept, I guess. Um, so to kind of give you an example, um, this shows proper um, deprecation because we can see that the page URL of borders is deprecated under the um, guide URL of lib1000, which is then under the domain. It's kind of like when you go to Amazon, and you go to Amazon.com slash clothing slash women's fashion slash shoes. So you know you're going to shoes in the women's fashion in the clothing of Amazon. That is the deprecation of information. Does that make sense? That, yeah, that it does to me. I, I am not, I can't speak for anyone else, but it seems pretty clear to me. <laughs> it's kind of like when you're thinking about subject categories in the Library of Congress or Dewey, you know, um, mm -hmm. topics and subjects being nested under other higher explanations. Great. Right. Great. Great. So um, we'll ask, uh, leave this, I think, as our last question because we are going far beyond our, <laughs> our standard <laughs> insight. So thank you for that. Um, we have a, a question here from, from Kelsey who asks, how do you recommend displaying videos and other widgets since LibGuides cannot collect stats on their use? We've been using links for tracking purposes, but this is not ideal. Is there a better way to do that, or do you have some other ideas? Oh, gosh, such a good question. Absolutely. Um, um, oh, I'm, thank you, Lauren, for I didn't mean disapproval, so thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> I do mean deprecation as, as in an HTML deprecation. So um, I will, I will Oh, 
and Talia. I think you may have cut out there. Let me see. Are you there, Talia? I think we lost you. <laughs> I think maybe we've gone too far over. <laughs> oh, boy. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello. Talia. This, can you hear me? This is Mark. Mark, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> maybe that was our cue. I stopped sharing my screen because I thought maybe suddenly that was affecting it. Um, so I'll just answer the original question quickly and then we'll praise the technological <laughs> gods for not um, uh, smiting us. So um, I was I was saying with uh, with embedded videos, you would probably want to embed embed those using a resource that allows you to track statistics from the original resource. So screencast.com is a great tool um, that shows you views on your videos. Um, same with um, uh, Vimeo is another great one. We use that here at SpringShare all the time. Um, with things like search boxes. That should really come from your uh, Google Analytics statistics, um, as well as your vendor that can provide you, you know, from this web page, these ma this many hits came from this libguide, you know, this many um, search queries were initiated from this page. So those might be something that you might want to track, um, try using Google Analytics slash your vendor to utilize um, website uh, widget statistics. Does that make sense? That does. That's that's very helpful. All right. Well, well, thank you, Talia, um, and thanks to everybody for sticking with us for um, as long as as you have. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Um, I'd just take a moment to give you, Talia, a virtual round of applause. You can't hear us all clapping necessarily, but we are. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I'll just remind folks that. We have recorded today's program, and please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL in Choice that should have um, both a link to the presentation and instructions on accessing the archive version. Thanks to everybody out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope you all have an excellent day. Mark, really quickly, um, if you want to of include course. my email in the email in your email, my email address. If folks sure. um, had a question that didn't get answered today, um, I'd be more than happy to chat with them. So you can pass along my email as well. We will definitely do that. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.